Welcome back. OK, let's get my next guest out. Uh, he can write, he can act, he can direct, he can host TV shows, he can do just about anything. I would call him a Renaissance man, if only I could pronounce it. Will you please welcome <laughs> Mr Stephen Fry. <laughs> Well, thank you for comforting young Ryland back there. Well, I always had a pleasure, <laughs> bless him. A little overexcited. Uh, hey, we have, um, we have matching facial foliage. Yeah, going and on, suits and hair, and I nearly thought of it. I did it too, wearing a green tie. We um, could be you, others. Yeah, we both decided against the uh, just for men option as well. Yeah, yeah, I've got I'll make mine go great. Do you, do you trip, you have a little just to I do, keep it down? I do, George Michael, okay. yes. Uh, George Michael. <laughs> uh, do you, you don't do the thing where people have a cardboard shape over to trim <laughs> it to a. You ever <laughs> seen that? No, you could do that. You can do that. I've never tried it. What about downstairs? Do you do the chest? The no, armpits, the knee. No, I you, don't. You're no. fully, you're fully flushed. But there's not much there, to be honest. I'm not, uh, not a Sean Connery. I don't you're have a hairy back or anything. I'm... What, what about in the underpants department? <laughs> there's, there's all that needs to be there. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Now I uh, went to see Stephen in a play this week. And, and I, I sometimes am remiss in my duties and don't necessarily always go and see every film or every play or read every book. I try my best to. Uh, and I was a little reluctant because, of course, it's Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, Stephen is currently to be found as Malvolio yeah. in The Bard's Twelfth Night at the Fabulous Globe Theatre over in South London, where they rebuilt the Globe. Yeah. And I was a little reluctant, but I thought, no, I'll go because I love Stephen and I want to see him perform. And uh, I said to Stephen afterwards, and I'm not just saying this, I have never enjoyed a theatrical experience as much. It completely blew me away. I've been evangelical about it ever since. I've been telling everyone, oh, you have to go and see this production. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine you're getting this kind of feedback it, from It has people. been simply extraordinary. Um, it, it is an incredible play in its in own right. Um, it's a remarkable production, I think. Uh, it's being put on the moment at the Globe Theatre. I mean, we're then moving to the Apollo in the West End. Uh, so the Globe, we're going of to reconstruct. Well, the Globe. It's open air, and it's, it's open as Shakespeare intended, but it's not just in that. That way that it's as he intended, no, is it? No, there's an audience of standees called groundlings in front of you who are literally standing all around you. You're in a sort of square and they're all around you, known as the yard, and then there are three galleries of people sitting. And if it rains, it rains right on the groundlings, but it doesn't rain on the actors because there's a sort of can wooden canopy over us. But it's exactly as Shakespeare's globe was, as far as scholars can tell, in every detail. And that includes our costumes. I mean, my, my hat is made of hair, hair, hair fur, the fur of a hair, and it's everything's hand-stitched. There's no machine stitching, no, no Velcro, no zips, everything's made. Um, but it's not just in the costume that it's as Shakespeare's end, of course, because all of the female parts... Exactly, are played by men. And, and one of those men is, quite frankly, I think, probably the greatest stage actor in the world today. Um, and uh, he's a phenomenon. He's got Mark Rylance. He doesn't do anything except stage, so you probably you wouldn't know him from television and film. But if you're a theatre goer, you'll know that he, he won the Tony Award for his performance of Jerusalem. He's he won, won so like many awards. Every award going for, for Boeing, him, Boeing, really? the American farce. Uh, for, he's playing Richard III, and he's playing the Countess Olivia in this. And I, I honestly tell you, uh, if there's no other reason to go to the Apollo to see the play, it's to see this man. He really is phenomenal. Uh, you know, I, genuinely, I can't recommend it highly enough to the extent why I. I I would resist going to see Shakespeare whenever possible. And I've seen performances I quite liked and moments I quite liked, but I, I, I like so much, I'm, I'm going back to see it again. Oh, yes. And uh, it's Very changed good. my mind. I don't think Shakespeare's a dick at all anymore. <laughs> I can actually see <laughs> what people have said. I used yes. to think it's all nonsense. You know, yeah. I've seen some oh, it's all that. lovies yeah. and nonsense, yeah. and they're just going on about it, and it's all, you yeah. know. But it's great. It's simply phenomenal. And the isn't people it? you said, the groundies, they stand, they stand for three and a quarter hours to watch mm. this, and no one looks bored. No. Uh, OK, let's talk about The Hobbit, because everyone's excited about this. Lord of the Rings, what a spectacular yes. achievement, what a remarkable success. Uh, there were many people who said this can't possibly work, and it probably exceeded the expectations. Yes. The Hobbit, the first of the new films, is out next year, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, At the yeah. moment, they're planning to turn that small book into three films. Yes, they are. And I can understand why. You can see he's in love with that mythology and yeah. those kind of characters. Uh, and you will appear in the second of the three, I believe. In the, in the second, I'm not sure about the third, because I don't know how it's been structured, that um, Fran, Fran Walsh and, and, and uh, Philippa Boynes and, and, and Peter Jackson, who write the scripts, have, have done an extraordinary job of, of, of basically sort of magnifying and elongating the whole, what Tolkien called, I think, his legendarium, this sort of world of, of creatures and their languages and everything else. And as most people know, it's all shot down in New Zealand, which is an extraordinarily yeah. exciting place to... to I've never been. Is this your first oh, time there? No, it's not. No, I've, I've filmed there for wildlife documentaries and various other things. Oh, and, of course. And, and, but, but it is... It's, it's, it's like... I mean, they're like Australians, uh, New Zealand, and without... With, 
best respect to Australians without the kind of attitude, if you know what I mean. <laughs> they're, they're a lot softer and sweeter. And in fact, I remember a meeting an Australian uh, just after I got back from Wellington, and he said, oh, how did you find uh, New Zealand? I said, oh, it's just a wonderful place. I loved Wellington. And they're so nice. He said, yeah, but don't you think they're too nice? <laughs> and I thought only an Australian would think someone was too nice. <laughs> too nice. Um, now, I wouldn't have had you down as an extreme sports kind of person. Oh, yes. But yes. I've been told that we have footage of you. In. We had a bit of time off, you see, and the South Island promises these extraordinary spectacular activities, one of which they kind of invented, um, which I took part in. And I, I was the last person to believe I would actually make this leap of faith. And this is, of course... The bungee jump. So it's Stephen, the original bridge from which the first bungee jumps were commercially bungee available. Now, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Well, you stay there. I would have said... I would have told... I would have sworn to heaven that I wouldn't, but I, I somehow thought, well, I'm here. I was a guest of the wonderful Sam Neill, who has a vineyard very close by, and um, he said, you've got to bungee jump. Everybody bungee jumps when they come to, you know, down to the, the South Island. And I said, well, yeah, everybody, but not Stephen. Stephen's don't do things like that. <laughs> and he said, yes, you, you, you kind of drove me off to the place and this bridge, Hackett Bridge, where, where it first happened. And, and you find yourself, it's like a dream, you know, one of those nightmares where you find yourself where you've always got a choice, but you keep going, oh, I'll, I'll say no later. And then you're walking on the bridge and I'll, I'll pull out of it in a minute. And then you're getting roped up. I'll pull out of it. And then it's around your ankle. I'll pull out of it. And then you go, whee! <laughs> <laughs> and then the extraordinary thing was, the moment I was finished, I was sort of hooked up and put in a boat. I said, I want another go, I want another go, I want another go. And I immediately had it. In fact, I had a three-way with these two Welsh girls, as it, as it were. <laughs> as it, were. Um, it was one of those spectacularly odd things that happens in life, was that um, uh, you get weighed, because they have to know your weight, because the absolutely crucial thing, so you don't drown, it's over a river, is that they, um, is that they get you just... They can ask you if you want to go into the water, kiss the water, or just above the water. And they do this according to your weight, the length of, and the elasticity of the rope. What did you choose? So <laughs> I chose just to go above the water for the first one and to kiss it for the second. Anyway, the girl <laughs> who was weighing me, I said, just on a sort of conjecture, trying to be Professor Higgins, I said, are you from Patalbot by any chance? She said, yes, I am. How do you know that? I said, well, you sound so like Michael Sheen. Well, I'm his cousin. <laughs> I said, that's ridiculous. And so I texted Michael Sheen and I said, I'm just talking to your cousin from Patalbot, and sort of said her name. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, she's, you know, organising a bungee jump. And he, and he texted back immediately, don't, don't leave any clothes or personal belongings. They're, they're thieving at, at swine, that family. And <laughs> 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 the Welsh cousins would talk about each so other you, like that. So you anyway, took her with you. Two, she, and she had a North Wales in friend, and they said, can we come with you? So I went on a second one. Let's have a look at a clip. Three, two, one. Wow. <laughs> you didn't commit. No, I didn't, did I? That, <laughs> that's the first time I've seen someone not... No. Because people normally dive, but you kind of... Oh, just, just, um... <laughs> Second time I dove, as yeah. they say in America, but, but uh, no, that time I just looked like a sack of... Um, you know, I looked but, like a bin liner full of yoghurt. I guess terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying on the way down, I yes. guess. It, well, it kind of is. It's so exhilarating, I can't tell you. Wow. It's, you've got such a natural high. I, can, I suddenly understand all these dangerous sports clubs and free running and all that kind of so thing. So would you do it again, do you think? Oh, in, in a heartbeat, I'm in sure. a New York minute, as they say. Uh, you know, I've got to mention, Stephen has a new series starting. I'm not sure when does Gadget Man begin on uh, I think it'll be. I think it'll be next year. Um, I, I, can't, I can't guarantee it, because we're still filming it, so I, I'd imagine it'll be next I year. It was, might be the end of this year. I had a lovely day. I was invited by Stephen to take yeah. part in Gadget Man, and this is where you look at all kinds of new... Right across yeah. the spectrum. But the, the different programmes sort of emphasise different things that we do in life that might need gadgets. Transport, you know, for example, was the one we chose with you. What we spent most of the day doing was, was stuck together in a very small electric vehicle. Yeah, the Renault Twizzly, I think it was called, or something. It was a, it was a tiny little electric car with big wheels and, and no, no roof. Yeah. Um, it was a quite damp day. You would have thought that one of us wouldn't get in on the one, but we're both fairly big gentlemen. We both squeezed in there, and we were in there for about, what, five oh, hours? Oh, yeah, you, had the, you were in the back, which was really tough. I, I we, we, we visited the Savoy Hotel. <laughs> well, this is what I loved about it. You know, and you might think being stuck in a small electric vehicle all day with no legroom would be purgatory, but no, it was a delight because, of course, you're with one of the greatest storytellers in the UK. And when we got to the Savoy, you told me a story of such an extraordinary oh, meeting, yeah. I couldn't quite believe it. Would you mind... We no, can... I'll share that with you. I, uh, for reasons we won't go into because it's too long. I, I was, and this sounds like the most appalling thing, just a way to start a story, but in about 1989, I happened to be uh, living at the Savoy Hotel. Uh, sorry, but that's... Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, so you get to know the staff and the, the link men, as they're called, the fellows in the tall top hats that we might think of as doormen or concierges, uh, link men. One of them said to me one day, he said, uh, Mr. Fry, are you a fan of uh, Frank Sinatra by any chance? I said, I am. I think he's an absolute genius. He said, oh, he's coming to stay in a couple of days. I thought, wow. 
God, I'm in the same hotel as Frank Sinatra. Um, and then um, one day I was coming back quite late one night, and the same link man was on duty. He said, if you said, follow me. And they'd roped off the American bar, famous American bar in the Savoy. And uh, there in the corner, sitting on his own, with a bottle and a glass of bourbon and a cigarette on, was Frank Sinatra. And the link man said, uh, Mr. Sinatra, this is uh, Mr. Stephen Fry, who's one of our regular guests, who's uh, is a promising young actor. And Sinatra pointed to a chair and said, sit down, kid. He called me kid. He called me kid. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought, I'm in heaven. And then, um, and about 30 seconds later, 20 people came in. And so I only had about 30 seconds with him, but it was still marvelous. So a couple of days later, I see the same link man. And I said to him, I have to say, I will thank you for the rest of my life. You, you introduced me to, I, I can say to anybody, I met Frank Sinatra, he said, oh, it's fine. I said, is he still here? He said, no, no, it's, it's quite funny, actually, he just left. Um, uh, as he was going, he, he pressed this huge roll of money on me. Uh, it was 20 pound notes, a great big roll of money. I said, thank you very much, Mr. Sinatra, it's very kind. He said, tell me, is that the, the biggest tip you ever got? And I looked down at it, I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, it isn't, Mr. Sinatra. And he looked most put out. And he said, well, who gave you a bigger one? I said, you did, sir, last time you stayed. <laughs> <laughs> and you realise how brilliant these guys are. <laughs> Both went away happy. Sinatra thought, I'm still the most generous guy in the world. And, and he knew the link man the next time Sinatra stayed, if he did stay, survive to stay another time, he'd get an even bigger tip. Even bigger tip. Yeah. What a fabulous story. What marvellous company. Thank Mr. You. Stephen Fry, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great fun. Stephen Fry. Don't go away, join me after the break. I'll be talking to the fabulous Taylor Swift. And we have live music from Ellie Goulding. So stick around. <laughs>